So this week's presentation, uh, this week's material is going to be on air pollution. This week's material is again in the textbook, so you can go and look in Masters and Ella for some of this work. See the last slide exactly what pages they are. The test that's coming up will not include air pollution. So please note, you will not be required to know this air pollution section for the test that's coming up. What that means though, is that from air pollution onwards will definitely be the, in the exam. It's not guaranteed that every single aspect of every single lecture will be in the exam, but the focus will be more on the stuff that is not in the test. So from this week onwards, will be more in the exam. The weeks before will be more in the test. However, the exam, I can ask you absolutely everything for all the weeks. In terms of today, what the objectives are is just to look at what exactly is the atmosphere, what is air, the resources, what is it, types and sources of pollution, the effects of pollution, and how can we look at controlling it. As a reminder, not everything might be covered in these notes, so please do go and read the textbook. So some obvious facts, some of the things that we already know. The atmosphere is a resource. What we mean by that is that oxygen makes up 21% of the atmosphere and oxygen is key to our well-being. We can't survive without oxygen. The remainder of that is nitrogen, which is roughly 78%. Argon is 0.93% with carbon dioxide making up the majority of the balance at 0.04%. Just a note there, that number might look small, but when we get to things like carbon footprinting, global warming in a few weeks time, that number is increasing as the years go on, thanks to industrialization. The atmosphere as well is not just a set of chemicals that we've got here, the nitrogen oxygen, but what it also does is that it blocks out ultraviolet radiation to protect the atmosphere. It can also moderate the climate, so it helps that's keep temperatures at a similar level, and it also redistributes water in the water cycle. So if it wasn't for the atmosphere, we wouldn't have clouds, that then get moved from over, and you can see in this picture, clouds from over the oceans that wouldn't get blown over onto the land to rain. So that's what the atmosphere is all about for this lecture. In terms of air pollution, so that's what we're looking at this week. Air pollution or pollution in general is just something that gets added either to the soil, the air or the water in concentrations that could be harmful to either us or to the environment. So air pollution would obviously mean that's chemicals added to the atmosphere. That addition of pollutants to the atmosphere could either be through natural events, so we could have things like fires, so fires will obviously have smoke that go up into the air to pollute the air. We're also going to have dust particles that are in the air, so there's sandstorms in the savannah or up in any deserts that blow particles up. Those particles can blow as far away as America, so that's also natural events or human events. So things that we do in the industrialized world, and as engineers, we are very guilty of this in polluting the atmosphere through our industrial processes that emit pollution through these sorts of stacks. In this, there are now going to be two different types of pollutants. We are going to refer to primary air pollutants as well as secondary pollutants. Primary pollutants are harmful substances that we emit or that are emitted directly from the source of the pollution. And the secondary air pollutant is something that forms in the atmosphere from these primary air pollutants. So a primary air pollutant might undergo a chemical reaction, chemical degradation, and go from one form of a chemical through chemical reaction to a second form, and that would be a secondary air pollutant. So what are some types of major air pollutants? So we've already said, or I've already mentioned that particulate matter, so things like dust, can already be a pollutant in itself. So anything from dust or smoke that is actually some form of particle. And then we have all the lists of typical chemicals that are going to be air pollutants that we might want to look at. So again, please make sure that you pause these videos and that you look through this list properly or you go through the PowerPoint version of this. Of particular note, we are going to have nitrous oxides. So nitrous oxides are typically anything with an NO in them. So it could be an NO2 or it could have any other NO in it. Anything that burns typically releases nitrous oxide or nitrogen dioxide or other nitrous oxides. So you might see this written as NOx, where the two is replaced with X. It often comes out as a reddish brown gas. So any chemical reaction or sorry, chemical plant that you might see with a stack in it, any reddish brown gas that comes out is possibly or most probably nitrogen oxide. The second one that is of interest to us or is typically or not of interest that is a major pollutant is the sulfur oxide groups. So these are also called 
SOX, so it'll be SOX, so instead of two, we have an X. So that's any sulfur oxide combination. And this one is a colorless gas, but this one has the typical strong odor. So often we can smell this all the way from Secunda, Sasselberg, those type of things from Sassel. So these two, the NOXs and the SOXs, form very much a part of industrial wastes. The other one that is going to be quite common is going to be carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So there's the CO2 and CO. Again, those are both colorless. And sorry, the, all of these so far are primary air pollutants. We're also going to get chlorine, benzene, methane. These are often in lesser quantities and often specific to certain industries. So what exactly do these pollutants do? So this is a slide where I really don't think I should be talking to. So please make sure that you pause this here and you read through or go back to the original slide so that you can see what each of these things are all about. So we said we had primary pollutants. So there was a list previously of the most common primary pollutants. So we had SOX, the SO2s, NOxes. So here you can see it's either NO or NO2, as well as the carbon dioxide type materials. Those would be pollutants that come from fires, factories, human sources. They could come from cars, even things like painting or other noxious fumes that might come from various other activities would become primary pollutants. These then react. So typically you would imagine that you have the NOs or the SO2s. If these had to interact with water, water particles, we now get the hydrogens that are now bonding onto this. So this would be a chemical reaction of some sort to form these secondary air pollutants. Some of the primary air pollutants are more dangerous. Some of the secondary pollutants might be more dangerous. So in the secondary pollutant, we have ozone, which was one of the big pollutants on a previous slide. Okay, so the major class of air pollutants, as already said, are going to be the particulate matter, nitrogen oxides or NOxes, sulfur oxides or SOxes, carbon oxide, so that would be carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, the hydrocarbons, and ozone. Particulate matter. So what exactly is the particulate matter? So if we break down, so this is just a random picture that I got down here, but if we get down to a dust level, so this is a little bit coincidental that this picture is actually up here, to be honest. If we get dust particles, anything from that, that can form particulate matter. So we see here it can include the soil particles. It could include soot, soot, sorry, pronunciation going off there, from things like fires, so any fire particles, sorry, the smoke from fires, that can also be particulate matter. Lead, asbestos, sea salts can even be a particulate matter, as well as sulfuric acid droplets. So there actually are physical droplets of particles that are large enough to cause pollution in the atmosphere, and they can also be dangerous to us as well. So the reason for that danger is that they may contain materials that are toxic, so simply just a toxic material, or they can be carcinogenic. So carcinogenic means that they could cause cancer, or they are small enough that they can float in the air, so they can be dispersed in the air. So they're not settling, they're not going to settle down in the air, but they are small enough that they can get lodged in the lungs or large enough that they can get lodged in the lungs at least. So often if you've been around somewhere where there's a lot of smoke and you cough up afterwards or you blow your nose, you'll see there's a lot, often a lot of black that you can get out of your lungs. That's from that particulate matter that is around in the air and this can be fairly dangerous. We'll get to a slide later on air quality in South Africa and around the world. And you'll notice, I'd suggest that you go and have a look at it. Particulate matter is often the one that comes up as the leading cause on any specific day of air pollution in and around Joburg, as well as in and around a lot of the other polluted countries around the world. And we'll see that slide in a moment. Okay, so nitrogen and sulfur, I'm grouping these together here. So these, as again, are the NOxes and the SOxes. These are gases, as I've already said, produced typically in petroleum plants or any time where there is burning. NOxes are produced by chemical interactions between nitrogen and oxygen at high temperatures. So main problems with these are that they are greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are going to cause an increase or are going to lead to climate change or can lead to climate change. And effectively, as a greenhouse gas, they are responsible for increasing the temperature of the atmosphere. And we'll, again, we'll get to that when we look at carbon footprinting in a week or two's time. Sulfur oxides are produced by the chemical interactions between sulfur and oxygen. So in a similar way, in the high temperatures and 
of burning with sulfur and oxygen as we had with noxes. Soxes can form, so you'll have sulfur oxides. These have a very distinct sulfurous smell, or sometimes we can get secondary pollutants of H2S, so it's that rotten egg smell. But additionally to that, if they interact or there's some reaction as a secondary pollutant in the air, water vapor gets into contact with these, we can have acid precipitation. So the sulfur and the H, H from water, the hydrogen from water, will result in H2SO4 type molecules. In terms of carbon dioxides, so carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, this is again going to be a greenhouse gas. So again, not going to spend too much time on here. We'll look at greenhouse gases and how they influence the carbon footprint in, I think, it's two weeks' time. In terms of hydrocarbons, so the more complex HCH molecules, as you probably know from chemistry, as you should remember, there's a, ver a variety of organic compounds that could be hydrocarbons. The most common is going to be CH4, so methane that is produced. So this can be produced from anaerobic processes, as we had in previous examples from wastewater treatment or other things. If this is not captured and goes into the atmosphere, this itself is a very dangerous or very potent greenhouse gas. So carbon monoxide is much more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. So some of these are also related to photochemical smog, as well as I've said greenhouse gases. So photochemical smog, we're going to get a hazy type look when you look over Joburg on a polluted day, should we just call it, and you can see that brown haze that hangs over the city. Ozone. Okay, so ozone, we have two different types of ozone. The first one is the tropospheric ozone, and the sex, second one, sorry, is the stratospheric ozone. The tropospheric is man-made pollutant, which is in the lower atmosphere. It is a secondary air pollutant, and that also forms a component of the photochemical smog. So it's also part of that haze that we see over the city, not just Joburg, any many cities around the world. The stratospheric ozone is a component of the atmosphere, so that's in the upper levels of the atmosphere that is going to screen out ultraviolet radiation all the way up in the top atmosphere. So this is not a pollutant, so we do not, should not be seeing this as a negative thing, this is a good thing. However, other man-made pollutants, other air pollutants, particularly CFCs, and I'm going to get this wrong now. Please just go and Google CFCs again. It's carbofluorochlorides, I think it was. They can destroy this stratospheric ozone. So when you see a comments about ozone, there is ozone in the tropospheric layer, which is a pollutant. The stratospheric ozone, which is the thing that is the, whenever anybody talks about the hole in the ozone layer, that is a bad thing. The hole is a bad thing. The ozone up in that level is a good thing. It is, however, man-made pollutants that are breaking that down, which is the bad thing as well. So where does, does our pollution come from? Now, this is a graph that was just taken off the internet at a random location at a random time. It is an average around the world, so it is fairly representative, but it obviously depends on where you stay. The biggest type of air pollutant is going to come from transportation. So all the cars, buses, things like that around the city, those lead to a large portion of the air pollution. The fuel combustion, so this is excluding vehicles now, so this is going to be anything that burns. So de again, depending where you stay, if you're using wood fire, wood for your heating, paraffin, anything like that in your cooking or your heating, any combustion is adding to another 21%. In the developed world, or sorry, developing world, developing world rather, where fuel is combusted for primary energy, this is obviously going to be a big number. Including in this number, and I'm this, sorry, I'm not sure if it includes this number or not, but the coal combustion, obviously in South Africa, is going to be a big impact in this as well. And I'm not quite sure, again, this is just a general diagram. It might fall under this one too. So I'm not 100% sure where we are going to get electricity production in here. So there's industrial processes is a 12%. Miscellaneous is going to then be everything else. So the miscellaneous includes this bottom bit here, intentional or unintentional forest fires. And obviously we all know about the Cape Town forest fire that happened on the mountain not that long ago. And those of you that saw the pictures will see how much particulate matter and smoke there was in the air because of that. So in the cities, We'll often see in a winter's morning, and I definitely saw this a few days ago, depending where you were in the city, you could also see some of this as you look out into the horizon. You get this brownish, depending on the 
severity of it. It sometimes looks a bit brown, it looks a bit orange, this haze that comes up. This is the photochemical smog that was mentioned earlier. So it is a brownish orange haze. It is formed by the chemical reactions, as we already said, between the nitrogen oxide, so the NOxes, as well as any other hydrocarbons, and the sun that is forming onto it that forms this haze here, which is a rather unpleasant looking thing and obviously not good for the environment or for the air quality in general. So what happens here is that we have nitrous oxide, so we have the source of the pollutants at the bottom. We have the NOxes, the carbon dioxides, and the chlorine, the hydrocarbons rather, which react in the atmosphere to cause the photochemical smog. Please can you just pause and you can have a proper look at the exact chemical reactions that are happening there. In terms of in the city, the smog that happens now, this is a very similar picture to the one that we had earlier, what are the causes of air pollution? So again, we have trucks, buses, passenger vehicles, so it's the transport sector that is causing this smog, this photochemical smog in the cities, as well as industries. So again, depending how many industries are in your city versus a little bit out. We don't have many ships and trains in South African cities, in Johannesburg at least, so this number would definitely be a little bit lower. And then consumer products and in the home, depending on what you're burning and what's happening in the home, it forms a very small percentage again, depending where you are of that smog. South Africa or Cape Town, sorry, Joburg is not the only one that has this chemical, this photochemical smog. I know having stayed in Cape Town that they definitely have it there as well. On the left, we have Beijing. So these photos are, don't actually show very well the smog, but you can see these are lower income houses here. So they are obviously keeping the, doing their heating and cooking on wood fired stoves. So this is where the source of this type of pollution can start. If you add enough of these together and industrial type things, Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world and you can't even see the horizon anymore. It just becomes this mush of combined orange white haze. I can't even see where the land ends and where the sky starts. So what is actually the problem? Why, why do we worry about air pollution? So if we look at the top here, at a low level exposure, it can irritate the eyes as well as inflammation of the respiratory tract. So it can lead to coughing and other types of irritations to the lungs as well as the eyes. But if it becomes more severe or you're exposed to it over longer times, it can develop into something more serious, some serious respiratory diseases and different effects. This slide is a little bit of a repetition of one of the previous ones. So we have on the left the pollutants, particulate sulf, soxes, noxes, ozone. Where exactly do we get them from and what exactly can happen if you're exposed to these over a long period of time? So please again, just pause and you can have a look at each of those. As a brief summary though, and letting me just do a little bit of talking on it, sulfur dioxide and particulate matter can irritate the respiratory tract. So that's irritate the lungs, the throat, the mouth and it can impair the ability of their lungs to change, get exchange gases. So if you have some gases, some sulfur dioxide or particulate matter blocking in your lungs, you're not going to get all the oxygen that your body needs. Nitrogen oxide, dioxides rather are the same thing, also cause airway restriction. Carbon monoxide is a little bit more serious. Carbon monoxide binds with iron in the blood. So if you breathe in air with carbon monoxide, it will actually enter your bloodstream. It will bind to your blood and that means that every carbon monoxide that is bound to a blood particle does not allow for an oxygen particle to now bind to that blood, part, that blood particle. So that means that your blood has less oxygen in it. With less oxygenated blood, you're going to get headaches, fatigue, so you're going to feel tired, drowsiness, and it can actually cause death. High levels of ozone, so this is the bad ozone that's in the lower levels of the atmosphere. It can cause burning eyes, coughing, and chest discomfort. So none of these things in the air pollution is what we want. It's why we all look forward to going to the beach where there's a little bit of wind to blow the air pollution away. It's all nice, fresh air because we don't want, our bodies don't naturally want these things in, our, in the lungs. So this slide is in here just because it's from historical purposes. So children are more susceptible to air pollution because their bodies are still developing and their lungs are still are smaller. It is actually more dangerous for children and is a greater health threat to children than to adults. As you grow up, you become more resilient, but the air pollution in a, child, in a child's lung can actually sorry, restrict the lung development. 
The point there, children breathe more often than adults. Children are often more active than us. We do. We sit behind a computer all day doing work. Children are running around. They're more active. They're breathing. They have a higher respiratory rate as well, so they breathe faster. So because of their higher breathing rates, or because they are breathing more, they get more of the pollution into their lungs and into their bloodstreams as well. Okay. It's also an issue here. So on one of the previous slides, I think it also had it. So high ozone areas can also lead to or a more can lead to a higher likelihood of children developing asthma. So as engineers, we have a responsibility to firstly reduce the amount of air pollution that we create. So let's not let's remove it at the source. If we are unable to remove it at the source and we have air pollution of some form, then how can we control it or mitigate it to some form? One of those ways is to have an air stack so just any sort of air stack that you've seen at an industrial site, an air stack that is fitted with an electrostatic precipitator. So what happens is that the dirty smoke or the dirty gas, we've called it in this diagram, gets pulled in here. It's then going to go up through the stack and out. OK, on this diagram, it's coming out on the right hand side, but I'm sure it could come out on the top as well. It goes out through there. There is a positive charge on the wall. We have an electrostatic rod or a precipitator down the middle, which is negatively charged. And if there's an electrostatic or elect electric difference between the wall and the center, you will end up having the charge, the particles attaching to one of the surfaces, which then will drop off through the bottom here. So this diagram on the left is of three chimneys. And from the description in the original picture, all three of these are the same inlet gas. The problem is that the one in the middle, the electrostatic precipitator, is broken in the middle one. So you can see what the original inlet gas looks like when the precipitator is not working versus the two when it is working. Just as a note here, you'll still see that there is some white, potentially some white smoke coming out. So often people will say, and mainly non-engineers will say, look, there's smoke coming out of the stack when often it might just be water vapor that you're seeing out of the stack. If you see this white smoke-like substance coming out, and then at some point it disappears, it's often just water vapor that's coming out. So if you compare that to the middle one, this brown stuff that comes out is brown, it's brown, it just seems to dissipate, not dissipate, it seems to spread out, and it never disappears. So that's the difference on a smoke stack. You can see there's the particles never disappear versus water vapor that actually does, it's not doing anything to the environment. It's not smoke, it's water. Okay, there are other options in controlling air pollution. And one of these common ones is to have a scrubber. So a scrubber is a fairly common type of piece of equipment as well. We're on the bottom here. We have the dirty gas coming in. So this red arrow, which will then go up and out the stack at the top through the scrubber. So what happens is these little pipes on the left here that go in have liquid water. So fine jets of water are sprayed over. And as the dirty gas comes in, the larger particles either get trapped in this water, in this mist that's coming through, or there might be some reactions that can take part. But either way, the chemicals can get caught into this. They fall down. And we now, instead of having an air pollution problem, we have a water pollution problem. But the water is often much easier to clean up and it's also easier to contain. Water is in a bucket at the bottom of the stack versus gas that's gone up and disappears into the environment forever. Often there's a final entrainment separator at the top, which could be just like a, basically seen as a fine filter or some other type, depending on the scrubber that you've got here. So scrubbers are very common in the chemical industry, and you'll see them for various reasons, uh, for various applications rather, not reasons. This is also similar to other chemical reaction type things if you want to have a contact with liquids and gases. But in this instance, we're trying to just clean out the water that comes, uh, clean out the air before it goes out at the top. OK. So this one, this is a bit of a controversial diagram here because I've heard that this isn't necessarily always the case. So the other way to control air pollution is when you're having a tanker that is dropping off petrol at a petrol station or at some other underground storage facility. This darker orange-brown line is the petrol or the diesel that is being dropped off. The fuel gets dropped off into this container. 
there is so that's the gasoline tube sorry that's an american diagram and then hose b the gray one is for a vapor tube so you're going to have liquid going in here it's going to enforce the gas out this gas is then obviously a hydrocarbon some various diesel petrol kerosene type thing which then gets up this diagram is not rec i don't theoretically they c you can recover this gas in this container this diagram is a bit misleading where it looks like this vents now to the atmosphere but it should be from what i understand collecting the gas back in this top here so then you're not getting this gas disappearing out elsewhere if you didn't have this gray line of the gas return any liquid that goes in here is going to pressurize this gas in here and you're not going to fill it up as well but so you do need to sort of just that gas a little bit Okay, so please note that I've got slides here that talk about the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act is a US regulation. It's not a South African regulation, but it's just used here for comparison. The textbook also talks a lot about the Clean Air Act of the USA, and obviously, again, that is the United States Act. We do have our own local acts as well, which we will get to very briefly in a bit. So this Clean Air Act, and I can't see the date on this now, it was 1990 something, I think. I can't remember, it might be on the next slide. So what the Clean Air Act said is that it authorized the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency in America, to set the limits on the amounts of specific air pollutants that were permitted. So it focused on six pollutants. So it was lead, particulate, sulfur, carbon monoxide, and ozone. So it's the ones that we've spoken about, okay, including lead, which I haven't really talked about too much, but it included lead. And you'll see that in 1970 all these green bars were here so after this came into effect in 2006 you'll see that some of these have dropped down quite substantially most of these on the right hand sorry the second one onwards dioxide that looks like about half the organic chemicals about half noxes not quite half particulate matter is decreased by more than half as well as carbon monoxide which went from about 200 to about 100 so just note there's a break in the scale here so it went from 200 to under 100 so it's also more than half so it halving of the pollutants thanks to the national clean air oh, sorry, the clean air act of the united states in south africa we have something similar so this is the national ambient air quality standards so these and i've given you a link at the bottom so you can go and open this up to get a better quality version of this again this looks at the soxes noxes ozone and carbon monoxide so let's just put that there so there we have there but a particular note, and it, uh, it happens in various of these regulations, is that there isn't a specific limit that says you're not allowed to release a certain amount of these gases, but it depends on the length of time. So if we start at the long one, so let's just look at SO2 that we can work through. In one year, and sorry about the quality of this, let me just, so we're going to stick to the South African standards. So in one year, the average amount of SO2 that you're allowed to emit has to be below 19 parts per billion by volume. So that's what the number in here is, parts per billion by volume. Or by a mass version, it's micrograms per cubic meter. So it is a concentration. So this is a concentration number. So that's the amount. On average, if you've got a sensor at your stack, that is the concentration that you're allowed to have during one year. You are going to have times, though, in your year where you're going to have more and there are times that you're going to have less. And everyone realizes this. So there might be a startup event. You might be burning something and for some reason that you've got a dirty piece of fuel that goes through, so it will increase. So what the regulations say that if you average it over 24 hours, it cannot be more than 48. So it can't be more than 48 over a single 24-hour period. You can't have 48 forever it can't you can't have this for weeks at a time and then still think that you're okay you're only allowed to have that four times per year so you still have to average 19 parts per billion in a year but you're allowed to have that spike of 48 in any 24 hour period in a 24 hour period you might even have higher spikes so in one hour you're only allowed to have in a one hour the same thing applies you can have spikes up to 134 or in a 10 minute period you can have a spike up to 191. So it does tell you again that you're only allowed this 88 times a year or 526 times per year. So this one you could have a spike up to 191 
parts per billion more than once a day that is still within the regulations. Okay. The same thing for nitrous oxide. We've got a yearly average and a one hourly average. You're only allowed to have it 88 times per, per year to spike ozone, carbon monoxide, and particulate matter are all given here as well. As comparisons, on the right here in this table, so this is a summary table of everything that you'll find in that link at the bottom. The European standards, though, is not in that link at the bottom. It's just added as a comparison. So you'll see here that there are some things that aren't given. So, sorry, in the South African standards, there's a 2015 version. That's just because that was the old number while we got ready for the new number. Some of these look fairly similar. So, sorry, the particulate matter is, nowhere, is not really similar. It's 120. Sorry, this is in brackets, so that's micrograms per cubic meter in South Africa versus 50 in Europe. Okay, some of the other things like carbon monoxide, those are identical, 8700 versus 8700. Ozone, 6161, nitrous, nitrogen dioxide, 21, 21, 106, 106, 48, 48, 134, 134 for SO2. So the standards in Europe are slightly more stringent because they don't allow for 10 minute spikes. So you always have to keep it below 134. You're not allowed to go up to 191. And the same thing for CO, spikes aren't allowed. And then these, as we said before, are just because of the dates. These numbers, so please just note, I've given you these numbers in front of us. Any of the numbers that relate to legislated values change from year to year. So these numbers, might you might see that I've actually given you the wrong numbers. Please just note, it's because the numbers that I try and find when I get these things are the ones that I find that are potentially most, most current, but they are updated all the time. And it's, if, I, if you are not working in this field day to day, you might miss out on the most recent numbers. So I mentioned what is the air quality like around the world. So if we look, and this was a snapshot on the 14th of May, so I tried to get this on a day close, as close to possible when I recorded this as possible. On the 14th of May at 12 o'clock Johannesburg time, Central African time, that should be 2021, not 2020. That date is wrong, it's 2021. There was a, a something happening over Johannesburg, Secunda, Sasselberg, somewhere down there on the bottom. The rest of South Africa was fairly clean. So the um, the key on this, sorry, at the bottom here, it's good, moderate, unhealthy. So as we get darker up to a red, red, purple, and brown, that's not all purple, indigos, those are not good. So if you had to go on this today, or whatever day you're listening to this, India is often in a red. China is also often in a red, and there are specks of Africa and Saudi Arabia that also go up into the red as well as into the other purple colors. The main reason for this, so you'll remember that this is a lot of desert over here. So I've already said that this is, link, is often because of particulate matter. Particulate matter can involve dust. So dust in the Sahara Desert is picked up and you'll see the wind direction. If you go onto this website live, these little white dots actually move. It's the weather, it's the wind patterns around the world. So you'll see that the dust is picked up over the Sahara and it's then blown over the sea. So that's why there's this big yellow patch over the sea, which can get all the way to the Americas. So I do know it gets over to Texas. It can go as far as Texas. The wind that, sorry, this dust from Algeria and this region here can get blown all the way to America. So that's the main reason why there's a lot of this yellow over Africa. Some of the areas in India, as well as China, is because it's still a developing country. So a lot of the households have their, either have their own energy source, so they're burning wood or other things. So there's a lot of smoke in these rural type dwellings. They don't have proper electricity supply, or they might not. The same thing in China. And there are, there's a lot of industries in China and in India that have pollution around. Okay, again, Namibia, I'm just seeing a red spot here. Why would there be a red spot? Again, that's on the day that this was taken, there was probably a sandstorm happening over the Namib Desert. In America, I'm just using America here. There's a big, there's not much, not many people living in this green spot of America. There is going to be some industrialization happening here. So there is, that's probably why the yellow is. But you'll notice that some of the other industrialized areas like United Kingdom, Germany, so that's Deutschland, France, Austria, as well as Australia, there's very green, a lot of green patches in here. And you might wonder, like, they've got a lot of, don't they have a lot of industries? Why is there not air pollution? 
And the reason for this is because they have the scrubbers and the electro, the precipitators, electrostatic precipitators, so that you can see that they probably are working quite well in some of these areas. Okay. I suggest you go and click on the link and you can see what's happening today. Does it look the same as it looked on the 14th of May, 2021? Okay, I can't go back now and I was meant to put a slide in here. If you Google, so when you're looking at that link, there's also an app that you can download onto your phone. And let me just find my phone quickly because I've I re-downloaded it just, just so that I could see what it's called. It's the S-A-A-Q-I-S. So I need to just open it quickly. It's the South African, South African Air Quality. Uh, sorry, this is going to take two seconds now. The South African Air Quality Information System, S-A-A-Q-I-S. So you can actually download an app onto your phone and it gives you the results of all the air quality stations in South Africa and it gives you a ranking from 1 to 10 of 1 being good quality air on that day versus 10 which is bad. So you can zoom in and you can see, sorry this is probably why I didn't do a slide on this because it's difficult to be able to do this on a PowerPoint presentation when I'm looking at my phone. So there are different zones, different points around the country. A lot of them concentrate in Gauteng, obviously because there's a lot of activity here, and the industrial areas on what is the air quality in South Africa at any given time that you could look at. Okay. There are other ways to reduce air to improve air quality um, in general, so not just electro electrostatic precipitators and things like that, but as we've gone through in this whole course, that if you can reduce at the source and not have the pollutant in the first place, it's a lot easier than trying to take out the pollutant at the end. So one of these things is reduce the sulfur content in petrol. I should have con I should have changed that, sorry. So the sulfur content in petrol or in gasoline, as the Americans call it, it can firstly clog catalytic converters. So the catalytic converters are in most modern cars to help reduce the air pollution. But if we putting if we have sulfur in the petrol in the first place, it's going to pollute the air outside and it's going to have a secondary effect of not being able to let the catalytic converter do its job. Okay, so there is a point here, and I've apologies, I've used some of the material from previous year's slides. We could require emission standards for all passenger vehicles, SUVs, trucks, and minivans to be um, improved. So if we could look at legislation or ways to reduce air pollution from vehicles. So one of the slides that we had before, as we'd already said, was that a majority of air pollution comes from transport. So let's look at reducing or increasing the standard strength, having better standards, higher demand for quality, and then we can reduce the emissions here. Okay. There's a point here as well that there is a potential to improve air quality by requiring emission testing for all vehicles. So if we had to get a vehicle every two years, four years, five years, you take your car, your bus, your ta minibus taxi down to a local testing station and have it tested to get a certificate to say that's all good. If you fail this, then obviously something needs to happen. Do we take, does the government take your, or the municipality take your car away? Do they give you a fine? Do they say you've got a certain amount of time to comply? This might sound like a ridiculously difficult thing to do, to get everyone to take their car down to a testing station every so often. But I do know that places like India that have a lot of cars and you saw a lot of pollution, they have mobile testing stations on the side of the road. So you can literally just pull your car over, stop at one of these mobile testing stations, and there are lots of them around the city. You put some sort of sensor into your exhaust, you start your car up, and this little tester gives you a little readout within five, ten minutes. So if, if they can get it right in India, I'm sure they can do it in other places around the world as well, if that's a way that we see to improve air quality. Okay, so we did mention previously, this slide is possibly a little bit out of place here. We mentioned that the ozone layer, so ozone depletion in the stratosphere, so this, if we look at the diagram, the stratosphere is the upper level of the atmosphere. When we have ozone in this layer, it is a good thing because ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun gets blocked, gets trapped, gets, does not come into the atmosphere when there is ozone. If there's oxygen, so the right-hand side, if we've got more oxygen here, so it's less ozone rather, so there's less ozone to protect, there's thus a hole in the ozone, the UV comes straight through and hits the Earth. So there's more ozone coming, sorry, more UV radiation coming through, which is harmful to us. So you'll see there's more coming through, there's only one purple line on the left here. 
So this means that there's a hole, so this is often over the Arctic, so the ozone, there's an ozone hole here. So the UV that can, sorry, that's coming towards the Earth is no longer stopped by the ozone and it comes straight into it. It was first identified in 1985 over the Antarctic, and as we said before, it's typically produced by human-produced bromide and chlorines contain, sorry, human-produced bromine and chlorine containing chemicals, so typically the CFCs that I've mentioned before. These were typically refrigerants that predominantly have been replaced now, but there are still some, some fridges and other things that would probably still have these around the world. The ozone depletion in the stratosphere, this hole over the Antarctic that we talked about, requires two conditions. The first is that there is sunlight, so the sunlight just returning to the polar region, and the circumpolar vortex, which is a mass of cold air that circulates around the southern polar region. Because of these two, when there's the isolation of this vortex from the warmer air in the rest of the planet, we then get this hole, we have this hole over the Arctic layer. That's where, why we have this hole on that side. Okay, so just as a, this might be slightly confusing, I'm looking at it now. Sunlight just returning to the polar region. Obviously, there is, because it's a polar region, when we have summer and winter, there is six months or there's times of total darkness during winter on the poles. So when the, the Earth tilts the other way in relation to the sun, that's what it means by the sunlight is just returning to that region. So when we have these clouds forming, this last point here, this is what enables the chlorine and the broma, bromine molecules, chemicals to destroy the ozone. So what is the effect of this? So again, this is slight repetition of earlier, so let me just go through this fairly quickly. The higher levels of UV, so we have more UV ultraviolet light coming into the earth. We get cataracts of the eye, skin cancer, as well as weakened immunity. It also disrupts the ecosystems and can destroy crops or forests. So what would it take to recover the ozone layer? So in 1987, the Montreal Protocol requested the reduction of CFCs. However, what they did was they started re using HCFCs instead of the CFCs, so it's the H added in, which is actually an, a greenhouse gas, so a pro may have led to a con, obviously phasing out of all the hydrogen, sorry, the ozone-destroying chemicals. What has indicated in 2000, and this I must double-check on the latest information, that the ozone layer was recovering. So in, if you were a child of the 80s, or rather the 90s and the 2000s, you would have learned a lot about the ozone layer in, the, in school, so you probably can tell me more about this than others. Um, but this is becoming less of an issue as we go on because of the Montreal Protocol and phasing out of these chemicals. However, a full recovery is not expected until at least 2050. So we, can't, we shouldn't go back on these measures that have been put in place. The next one that I want to have a brief look at is acid deposition. So it's called acid deposition here, and I've left it as acid deposition because I think it's referred to this in some of your textbooks as well. The textbooks, the, um, the Masters and Ella, is effectively acid rain. So what happens is we've already mentioned that we have soxes and noxes, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, that are going to be emitted through burning or some combustion processes. Once they are in the air, they are going to react with water vapor, so anything with a water vapor, anything reacting with a water vapor, that water vapor has an H in it, that H is going to attach to the SOX and the NOX, so you now have an H, SO4, H something else, so it's going to result in acid. So we have an acid that is formed because of these gaseous emissions. Because we now have them in water vapor, water vapor in the atmosphere is there because of clouds, those clouds eventually rain down. So once they rain down, we are going to no longer have a neutral water that falls down in the rain, but depending on the air pollution, we are going to have a weak acid or even a strong acid, depending on how much sulfur or nitrogen was in the air. What this water does do for us in a good way is that it removes the sulfur and the nitrogen from the air, so it effectively cleans the air, and it is acting in, in, as a natural scrubber. So exactly the same way we were explaining how does a scrubber work earlier, rain is a scrubber as well. The problem is that that water that it's now, is now acidic is not collected like we did in the scrubber. And if we collect the water from a scrubber, we can then clean it and neutralize it as we see fit. But what we now have is that this water lands on farmlands, 
on you and me and anywhere else that it rains, and that acid water can now cause damage wherever it lands. So this is just a picture of what we're meaning here. The socks and knocks from the industrial areas go up. There's a reaction, and there you can see the H2SO4, HNO3, and HNO2. Different acids then rain and land on not just natural vegetation, but they land on industrial things, and well, they land wherever rain lands, obviously. So what this acid rain means is that it can decline the aquatic animal populations. A lot of this water will end up in waterways. So it will flow back onto the land through into rivers, dams, and the sea. So because the water is now acidic, you're going to get a decline in the water, the aquatic animal populations. It also has an effect. So it's seen there in the second bullet point that's thin shelled eggs. So if you have a thin Sorry, thin shell, thinner shelled eggs. Because calcium is unavailable in the acidic oil, you're not going to have as good a quality egg for birds, for bird reproduction. So that's going to affect the birds because of acid disrupting the calcium in the soil. You're also going to get, and this I need to double check these figures to see what the latest numbers are on this as well. If you have acid landing on forests, it's obviously going to affect plant growth. So 50% of the black forest in Germany, which is one of the famous forests in the world, is destroyed because of acidic water that's landing on here. You will recall going back to, and this is why I need to check these numbers, if you recall going back to those original diagram that I showed of air quality around the world, Germany was in the green, so I'm not too sure how big an effect this is to Germany, but it is obviously a big impact to areas that had high sulfur levels in their, or sulfur SOX levels in their atmosphere. So yeah, there we go, that's the, the diagram for how this will work. So I'm not gonna go through this, please pause again so you can have a look at that diagram. So air pollution around the world, depending on where you are, what day you're talking about, where you are in the world, what's happening at that specific moment, the air quality in general is generally deteriorating in the developing countries. So developing countries are becoming more industrialized, they have more industrial plants, chemical plants, so more chemical plants means that there's more air pollution, so their air quality is degrading. So typically, places in China, and you saw on that map as well, there are places where residents only see sunlight for a few weeks each year because there is so much smoke around. The other problem with developing nations is that we often have older cars. So in South Africa as well, maybe not yeah, this is a, we are a developing country, I would say. We have older cars. Some of these still use leaded gasoline. So leaded gasoline literally has lead in it. So when you burn your fuel, you have lead that comes out of that petrol. Um, we no longer have leaded gasoline in, or leaded petrol in South Africa. There are other countries, though, that have leaded gasoline. We do, in South Africa, have older cars. So there are countries. So I know Singapore is an example where you are not allowed to keep your car for more than two years. So the logic behind that or the theory behind that is that if you keep your car for longer than two years, your catalytic converter, the technology inside your car is now outdated. And if it's outdated, it's now polluting more than a newer car would. So in my mind, there's a little bit of a catch-22 situation here. Do you now throw away your car to get a new car which has better technology that's not going to pollute the air but obviously to make that new car, you're probably polluting somewhere else. You're converting, you're also converting an air pollution problem into a solid waste problem. Or what often happens, and I know Japan has been guilty of this in the past, where you're not allowed to keep a car for a certain length of time, or they test your car, and if it's polluting too much, you have to get rid of it. And what happens with those cars? They often send them to another country in the world. So at one point, South Africa was accepting these sort of cars, so cars that were too dirty or they were making too much pollution for their home country, but we were accepting them into South Africa. From what I understand, we are no, South Africa no longer accepts these cars, but there are other countries in Africa that do accept these cars. So these second-hand cars that, are, that cause more pollution than new ones, because obviously, what are you going to do with a two-year-old car? Are you really going to put it in a landfill? So I've put some, a list of countries here, or this list is a, a typically, if you Google worst cities in the world for air pollution, Beijing, Mexico City, we've already seen that one, 
Shanghai, so it's China, Iran, and India. So you'll see that there is the countries listed here were in that list of countries, or so not list of countries, were in the diagram that we showed earlier in the red zones. So I have heard before that if the pollution is so bad outside, why don't we just sit inside all day, close all the windows, and then we don't have to worry about the dirty air outside. Let's have some form of air purifiers inside, and then we can just not worry about what the air is like outside. So this is not as simple as that, and indoors we can often have pollution that is just as bad as outside, or sometimes even worse. So this diagram on the right, I'd like you to pause it to go through it and just look at each of these carefully individually, and I'll go through some of them now. But there are types of air pollution inside that could be quite dangerous. Depending on where you live, some of these are no longer valid, and some of them are only valid in certain areas. So the one that I, do would, that I would like you to look at, and it's in the textbook, is the example of radon. So please just go and have a look at radon as to why that one is dangerous. The main reason for that is because it is a it is radioactive or it's from radioactive sources so that's why that one's dangerous there are other types of examples here so as i say not all of these will be applicable to everyone so the one that i had not that i'd forgotten about rather was that there is a possibility of chloroform to come from chlorine treated water in hot showers so if you've got chlorine in your hot water you may get chloroform that comes up as the very extreme example here there are other examples like ammonia. So we keep under our sink at home, we've got things like Handy Andy and Domestos and all the other bleachers that are under there. There can be ammonia in there. That ammonia could then fill the area and you have air pollution inside. Things like fungi and bacteria. So typically, so this is an American house again, so we don't typically have heating or air conditioning in our houses, but fungi and bacteria could also grow in showers. So you get mold in showers that can cause various issues. So other chemicals that we have in the house, this bottom one here, we might have drain cleaning fluid, we have mothballs, there are various other things from paints and thinners or stripping materials in the garage. All of these could be chemicals as primary pollutants or which may come and become secondary pollutants that are trapped in the house. I'm hoping none of us are indoor smokers and if you are indoor smokers, tobacco smoke is obviously a big issue. So then we can just keep the window open to have that smoke going out. So the solution to coming running inside to getting away from outdoor pollution is not going to fix anybody's um, problems. So typically inside it is recommended to keep windows open. So if there is anything and so, uh, most of these things on this example are really extreme, I wouldn't expect many or any of these things to be in any of our houses in a normal house. But if we are worried about it to keep the windows open so that these indoor air pollutants can go out but then obviously outdoor pollutants can come in as well so it is a bit of a catch-22 again okay so here's the example of radon so if there are floor cracks please look at the, the example in the textbook this breaks it down in a lot more detail as to what exactly is happening here okay so as i said i don't think i've covered everything that um I need to, and I don't know why, uh, uh, sorry, I see that, sorry, page 367 onwards, I need to just double check, I will upload a new version of these slides, because I do see one or two errors as I've been talking now. I will give you the exact pages if you please go and look at the new version of the slides that are online that I'll put up in a day or so, once I've fixed all the other mistakes as well, I'm not needing you to read all the pages. So there is a section on pretty much what we've discussed now, as well as that example I was talking about on radon. That's all in the textbook with a lot more detail. This again is not in the test, but it will be at the, in the exam. The TAT that I've given you is also from the textbook. So the textbook examples, I think I've stopped at problems. So they're the problems at the back of the textbook or the back of the chapter rather. I've stopped at problem seven, but you can probably go on a little bit further in the sections that I've asked you to read, so you'll be able to answer some of those. You will notice that those that this week's TAT, all of the questions I've given are numerical type questions. So calculate the volume, the size, the mass, it's numbers. So in the test or rather in the exam, I will, uh, will be asking you questions on numbers. So please calculate a certain quantity quality as I've done in the TUT. So I will only ask questions like in the TUT, the similar sort of questions, but I can also ask you 
reasoning or understanding questions as well. So anything that we've discussed in this week's lecture, I will also ask you your understanding of the things that are there. Again, Friday, please come and attend if you have any questions. The open, the, sorry, the discussion is still open as always. So if you need to ask me a question before Friday, please make sure you drop a note there so that I can get to you sooner than Friday if needed. Thanks.